No, I get to cheat. <laughs> Ooh, that was good. All right. And we're live. All right. Uh, so we're here with uh, Mike Stay, uh, another fantastic uh, speaker for uh, Virtual DEF CON Safe Mode. Uh, he is covering uh, how he recovered uh, a six-digit sum of worth of Bitcoin from an encrypted zip file. Um, and I guess uh, if you just want to like quickly go into your talk, spend just like a minute or two, uh, and uh, then we'll start asking you some questions. Yeah, sure. So um, short summary is I used to work as a reverse engineer back in the late 90s. Um, I broke the zip encryption that was used by InfoZip, which was the open source version. And so everybody except PKZip based their, their encryption on that, um, particularly WinZip that had like 95% of the market at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so then 20 years later, somebody locked up their Bitcoin in a zip file that they made on their Linux box and forgot the password. Um, so they came to me and said, hey, I found your paper. What's the current state of the art? Can you help me with this? <laughs> and this is your first time talking at DEF CON, right? It is, yes. Yep. Uh, so we, we've given him fair warning, but uh, there is a tradition for first-time speakers of DEF CON. Uh, they get to take a shot with us on stage. Uh, QA session is the closest thing to a stage. So uh, thank you, Mike, for providing DEF CON with some wonderful content. And cheers to you, man. Thank you for having me. <sighs> All right. Um, okay, so uh, I was I was actually kind of surprised. So um, I have never thought about zip encryption as being uh, something that would be difficult to get around. Uh, you did go in through a couple of different types of encryption. I was also surprised that like, well, I wasn't surprised that early word uh, was as difficult as it was. But I later on the the 40 bit encryption that was just really difficult to brute force that one kind of surprised me do you have any other uh have you worked with any other type of encryptions that have been surprisingly difficult to like get into for being such a legacy weird proprietary protocol um let's see there were a couple where they clearly knew enough um to be dangerous, but then, <laughs> then completely screwed it up. Like uh, early word perfect, um, you know, the the founder of the company had broken that one himself, and then uh, when they released their new version, saying, "Oh, now we're using strong crypto, nobody will be able to break this," he went in and found that they took the password and then ran it through Des in the wrong way and got out some vector and then just XORed their file with it or something ridiculous like that. So they, they had DES, but they didn't use it right. It was so just, close. Just, just, yeah. just didn't um, quite, quite there it. There were ones like um, Microsoft Access 97, I think, was one where they had RC4 encryption, but it was a fixed key. And so they would RC4 encrypt the file with this fixed key, and then you'd go to this offset in the file and, and look up the password, and it was just sitting there in plain text. Uh, well, that's... Um, Oops. Now, uh, some of the details might be off. It's been 20 years. Yeah, but yeah fair. That's fair, fair. Yeah. Uh, so so I, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Val. I, I want to ask a really, uh, while we wait for people to come up with some really good technical questions to throw at you, I'm going to do one that, uh, um, all right. So let's say that I don't know everything there is to know about encryption out there. Um, let's say I want you to do, a, I'm going to ask you to do a similar thing that you did in your talk. And I know that uh, my password starts with a word and has some unknown thing after that. Are there things that I can provide you uh, that I might know about the password that will help you get through this? Or um, does the encryption yes. work in such a way that that doesn't work? A dictionary attack, right? The product you're using has strong crypto. The the guys that built it knew what they were doing. Then pretty much a dictionary attack is the only option you've got left. And so um, there are specialized attack software that you can get. One of them is called Hashcat. Uh, it's built for running on GPU farms. 
that was what we were originally looking at as maybe writing a hashcat module for this but it's really designed for processing a key space um, and so you can give it a dictionary you can then say take this and um, then do all alphanumeric strings up to length six after it or take this and try all different capitalizations replace um, vowels with numbers say you know an i goes to a one or an o to a zero and so on e to a three whenever you do that sort of thing you can there are these rule sets that you can say okay hashcat this is what you're going to start with and these are the rule sets that i want you to use when when processing it because this is the best of my memory what the the password looked like on the other hand if you're doing something like correct battery horse staple from xkcd you've got too much entropy and that's really the way to protect your files if, if you're doing something is just make it longer mm -hmm. right because if you go from um 26 characters which is you know all lowercase letters um to 97 you've roughly tripled that's adding uh two bits um per character to your to the entropy right so if you've got a length eight password 26 to the eighth has you know all, all possible um, lowercase letters there but if you go up to 97 all printable characters that's only adding two bits per password i'm sorry two bits per character so um, on a length eight password that's let's see 26 is about five bits right? that's 32 um, and two times eight is 16 so it's adding three characters to the length of your password adding um, printable characters to a password of the same length you know is just adding a few more but if you go and add a whole bunch more char more characters to your password make it a long one that'll make it really secure and Using so a passphrase instead of a short random string yeah and so if, if you even if you're using english words right if you make it a passphrase rather than password that'll make it really um so vulnerable to a dictionary attack. There may be other attacks if the crypto is bad, but if the crypto is good, then it'll it'll protect you. So uh, just this is entirely for my own curiosity. So after you broke through the zip file, uh, you you got the the password that you could use to decrypt the zip file. No, we didn't recover the password. Oh, you did so, recover the password. Okay. Yeah. So the way the way zip works is it derives a 96 bit key from the password and okay. it was the 96 bit key that we recovered now if we wanted the password we could take those 96 bits and then go launch a, a hashcat attack using dictionary and and some other stuff that that others have have worked out to get a few of the initial characters mm -hmm. that's um, where it fits into right. the type of password cracking that many of us are familiar with, yeah. with hashcat or john the ripper okay yeah. Yeah. so what, if what, you've got the 96 bits then there's something you can do with the dictionary attack that'll see whether the initialization process gives you those bits or not that's great yeah what i was going to ask is if you got far enough to see if like a dictionary attack would actually work against the zip file in less time than you spending all this time to brute force it uh, but um if you didn't he suspected it was on the order of um you know 20 something characters so or more so it would take quite a while to to brute force would, would this uh, technique that you went through work for any encrypted zip file or uh, yeah yeah, yeah. this this will work on any zip file with so my original attack back in the late 90s mm -hmm. um required five bytes uh, five files in the archive with the same password this one we were able to get away with two because we also knew the um the uh, timestamp so if you've got the timestamp and you've got two files then then this will work on any of them so how does the number of files affect the crackability of the zip file um when suppose you don't have the timestamp okay. okay in infozip it was meant to run on unix machines as well as windows machines mm -hmm. so on pkzip they just allocated some memory and used whatever bytes were there yep. and those were random bytes in infozip on many unix machines it would um, initialize the bytes to zero. And so there would be no randomness there. So they used the process ID and the timestamp to get a little bit of entropy and then fed the XOR of those two into C's RAND function and generated a bunch of bytes. But they thought maybe that's too weak, right? Um, there were 
some known plain text attacks and they're like, well, if they brute force the, uh, the timestamp and the process ID, then they can derive the rest of these bytes. And so they took the password and encrypted those bytes once. And that's what they used as the random bytes when they encrypted that and the rest of the file. But when they encrypted it twice, because of the way the zip cipher works, um, it produced the same stream byte twice at the beginning. So it encrypted it once and then it decrypted it for the first byte of, of each file. So, so when you, when you so say that, is it, is it files in the archive? I have every 10th output of that of C's RAND function and 40 bits were enough to figure out the 31 bit internal state of C's RAND function. So once I knew the internal state of C's RAND function, I could generate those first 10 bytes of each file. And then I would do a bunch of bit guesses. And because of the way the cipher was designed, not all 96 bits were used when producing each output byte of the stream. Um, so I guess like, 40 something bits up front. And then because I had five files there and I knew what those bytes had to be, I could filter all of those bits. I could say, I've got to know which of these uh, 40 bit guesses are correct before moving on to the next stage. Got it. And so by having five files, I could both derive the internal state of C's RAND function and filter my guesses and finish one stage before moving on to the next one. And so it was a parallel divide and conquer attack. In this case, I only had two files. Mm -hmm. So even though I was making a 40 something bit guess, I only had two bytes to filter it with. So I, you know, um, that meant two to the 24th wrong key guesses <laughs> went to the next stage and I had to guess more. And so it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger up to two to the 60 something before I could start paring it down mm -hmm. at the other end. So, so just I for clarification, it. it's resetting the stream cipher every single time it encrypts a separate file. And that's why you're able to do this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it starts over again with the same password, resets it to the original state and, and starts from there. Cause you want to be able to extract a single file from yep. the zip file without having to extract all of them. That makes I sense. I think you just answered one of the questions we got with the new attack. Is there an acceleration in having more files in the archive? That's Absolutely. I mean, in, in the original attack, the more files you had, the faster it went. Um, and so this is just a refinement of the original attack. Um, but certainly having more files means more bits to filter with and, and getting rid of false positives earlier. And uh, sort of closely associated with that, um, do you know if this kind of attack works with uh, the other encrypted uh, archives like 7-Zip and RAR? Most archival software now uses AES, like RAR5 okay. switched to AES-256. So this isn't going to work against anything except ZIP files. Going for best standards. I like to see that. <laughs> Even even WinZip switched to AES a while ago. So fair enough. Uh, we, we we had another question. Um, uh, do you know if your client was the legit owner of the uh, Bitcoin? I, I can't be certain, but um, we looked him up online. Uh -huh. uh, we knew his real name, and we looked him up online and found that he had reason to be owning Bitcoin. It did, um, didn't so, seem too yeah. shady. It wasn't someone reaching yeah. out across the dark web from it was part uh, of his employment that he would be dealing with Bitcoin. So. fair enough yeah. um no that makes sense so no this is this is really interesting um have do you expect with putting this out here and uh providing this talk do you expect to get more of these requests to crack more things if you do get more of these requests do you have an answer pre-built of uh, how you might respond? As far as um, breaking into Bitcoin wallets, yeah. When I first um, when I first wrote this up on my blog, um, we got a whole bunch of requests, and for most of them, I had to say, "Nope, sorry. You, the best you can do is a dictionary attack." Many of them said. You know, I, I bought Bitcoin with a credit card ages ago, but now I can't find my wallet. Can you help me? I've got my credit card records. <laughs> uh, no, we need a little more than that. Um, the one that was most interesting was a guy who claimed that his hard drive had crashed that had Bitcoin on it. And so we were working with him to get some data recovery. But after a while, it became clear that he was um, perhaps schizophrenic or delusional that he believed that someone was 
cheating him out of his Bitcoin and had stolen. Uh, anyway, it was so, uh, interesting. But uh, uh, that said, if if you have there, there are about four situations where we could potentially recover software. Uh, one of them is if you uh, printed out or wrote down the seed phrase for generating the, the 128 bit key, right? When you generate it, the wallet software always says, keep this in a secure place, right? And it's this 30 odd word um, phrase that'll generate the 128 bit key. So if you've got that, you can recover the key, you can recover all your Bitcoin. Um, the next case is if you uh, have had damage to your hard drive, right? If the hard drive crashes, then the data in the sector is probably okay. And even if the data in the sector is bad, we only need eight bytes to be okay that has the, the encrypted key in it, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can recover that data, then we can probably recover your wallet. Um, if you have the wallet software, you don't have the original phrase, but um, you know you used a weak password, then we can try and do the dictionary attack approach right. and do that. And then the least probable, um, there have been wallets with security flaws that make them susceptible to, to breaking more easily. And if you happened to use one of those back when they were mm -hmm. being um, being used, most of them have been fixed since then. But right. um, if you happen to use one that had a flaw, then we could try to exploit that flaw. Yeah. So, so this, this will, yeah. So, so this, this was an attack on on a zip file. But you're you're talking directly about uh, Bitcoin wallets. Uh, do they yes, also Bitcoin use? Wallets, yeah. Do they also use uh, some zip like structure? Have you attacked the Bitcoin wallets themselves? Um, like so the Bitcoin wallet uh, takes the key, the the private key information that you sign your transactions with, and a password and generates a symmetric key from the password and some salt and then encrypts the private key. So that private key is really what gets you access to the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. What we can do is try to either recover the private key by means of that really long phrase, regenerate that same private key, or we can attack the password if you've got the wallet so that we can decrypt the private key that you had stored, mm -hmm. or we can at attack some flaw in the in the cipher where for instance, um, when they were coming up with the symmetric key, they didn't use the entropy properly. And so there's a much smaller key space that we would have to brute force. There are very few of those that, that were out there, but there were some. So that there's a possibility we could do that. Uh, so I like asking this question to people who know this technology really well. Uh, feel free to tell me, no, uh, you're not going to answer this question, but do you yourself hold any value in any cryptocurrencies? Because you seem to understand how it works. Um, I don't because I have, I mean, there's no inherent, um, When you pay taxes, you pay taxes in dollars because the government says you have to pay taxes in dollars. So there is this um, built-in necessity to own dollars at some point. There is no built-in necessity to own Bitcoin or, or any other um, cryptocurrency, right? There's, um, and for Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think that uh, proof of work has shown itself to be uh, susceptible to attacks like um, Sybil attacks, 51% attacks, like Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic have both suffered 51% um, attacks. They were you know, rebuffed eventually, but you know, if Google wanted to deploy their whole infrastructure, they could completely own Bitcoin. <laughs> there, there are existing um, companies that, that could do that, not to mention nation states, right? If the, mm -hmm. if the U.S. wanted to take it down, they've got this thing in Tooele here in Utah that they could deploy against um, taking down Bitcoin. So um, my personal take, and, and we designed a system um, to do this, is that you need to use a consensus algorithm with true finality, that um, proof of stake and bandwidth uh, and then after a certain point, when you have enough witnesses, you say this block is finalized and it can't ever change. Ethereum is trying to move in that direction with their proof of stake algorithms, but um, uh, I, I don't have any. 
Yeah, I've mm -hmm. heard I've heard of proof of stake, but um, the finality piece is uh, new to me. Um, You've definitely given me a few pieces already that I'm going to need to go Google. Once we're done with this. <laughs> uh, so we, we got another question. Uh, it's sort of a, a meta question. Uh, the uh, one of one of the people that watched your talk uh, had a little bit of struggle following your math. They understood. Uh, all the aspects individually that you talked about, uh, but zooming back out, they seem to like lose pieces in their head, uh, and they they want to know um, it's like how do you juggle this, and like are you aware that some people that f like follow your talk might have difficulty zooming in and out like that? Yeah, so um, I had some options when when doing this talk. One was to go really deep and really hard on the technical stuff. Yeah. Another one was to give enough background and, and the basic idea of how this attack played off and the challenges we, we faced. And so I chose to be less uh, detailed for the sake of the story rather than Fair. go deep into it. Um, so if anyone has any off. technical questions, take them offline. I'll be happy to talk through them with you and mm -hmm. point at lines of code and that sort of thing. That's great. That's awesome. Is there uh... as far as keeping it in my head, um, I would have to wake up and then come down and reload everything. I had stuff on whiteboards all over my office, pictures. It it was a process. I would even have to remind myself about what was going on because I couldn't keep it all going at, at once. And and it was a months long process of trying to think through over and over again how things are going wrong and what I might be able to do to to fix it. So if, if you don't get it from one short 45 minute talk, I, I certainly don't blame you. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, did, did we discuss this at the end? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed this point. Uh, did you actually get any compensation for this work? We did, yeah. So when, when he first talked to us, we said we'd like so much up front. Um, we estimate that the total cost will be about this much. Um, we took longer than we said we would. Uh, we expected it to be done in three months. That was October, so November, December, January. It was April before we actually, late March, before we actually got the key back. But because of all of the extra cryptanalytic work that I did, it took a tenth of the time on the hardware. So um, the, the hardware cost ended up being only roughly 10, 15 grand as opposed right. to the 100 grand that we thought it would take at the beginning. And so he gave us a big bonus afterwards, which was nice. Yeah, I uh, I actually missed this. Um, uh, another one of the, the speaker goons was uh, mentioned that it was on AWS. Um, and they wanted to know if the, the 10 to 15 was about what you were expecting from compute cost. No, we, we were expecting it to take far more, right? The original estimate was around two to the 64th work, which is comparable to finding a collision in SHA-1, right? which is um, 100, sorry, SHA-1 was 160, MD-5, right? it was a 64-bit thing. Um, and there were, um, there was some recent work where to find a collision, they had to deploy an enormous amount of work to do it. I guess MD5 they were able to do because of flaws in the site in the in the hash function. Um, SHA1 took roughly 100k of of uh, GPU time to to break, and so we were estimating it would be comparable uh, to do this. And uh, th is this is uh, what your company does, like data recovery, or is it specific to crypto Not stuff? Not originally. Um, originally, we were working on a distributed operating system. Um, we could get clients interested if we can get in the door, but it was right at the time when cryptocurrency was taking off, and we didn't have to talk to anybody to get them <laughs> into We started doing some consulting work there, built up a team of about 20 Scala developers that were top of the um, cream of the crop, top of their field, um, and then built the Archain cryptocurrency platform. Um, Archain started having some financial troubles, so we allowed them to hire the devs early. We had a contract that we'd hold on to them for a while, and then they could hire them after they'd worked for us for a year, mm -hmm. but we let them hire them early. Uh, so they've taken over the dev team. 
Um, and then we started working on some other things and this particular consulting job came up at a nice time and was a whole lot of fun. So we took it. But right now we're, we're looking for any interesting consulting work that people have. So that was exactly what I wanted to segue into now that uh, you've done this talk. Um, what is, do you have another research item on your uh, to-do list that you're trying to aim at? Sure. Um, at the moment I'm doing some consulting work for the Ethereum foundation. Um, I've got some uh, consensus algorithm research that I'm working on. We're working, we got access to GPT-3, so we're building oh, cool. an adventure game, kind of like AI Dungeon, but with more structure using GPT-3. That's um, awesome. We've got uh, various ideas for voice assistants that will, you know, be able to carry out call somebody at a, at a restaurant rather than figure out every different restaurant's online ordering system. You just have your, your assistant call them up and have a conversation. GPT-3 seems to be able to have conversations. So maybe we can use that. Yeah. I, this is probably like a really small piece of what you're doing, but uh, I used to be like incredibly into MUDs. So an adventure game that's generated by GPT-3 sounds interesting. Yeah. So we're working on um, the room generation, uh, for quests, we'll have things like you have to convince this character to give it to you. He's got oh. desires and and needs, so you know you'll you'll have to be role playing while you're doing this game, uh -huh. uh, interacting with with these characters. Yeah, and there there is a uh, a person that goes by the handle Evil Mog is running a DefCon uh, CTF mud uh, right now. Just a shout out to to him. We are um, really close to being out of time. There are a oh, lot yes. of questions over here about specific pieces, specific technologies. I think I'd like for uh, people to bring those to you um, on a less moderated basis. So we'll, we'll let those go for now. Um, before I let you go, I want to know what is the thing that you would like us to take away from this? If there is a, a, a final idea that we should walk away from your talk. Um, that attacks on cryptography only get better. Right? Uh, at the time, MD5 was proposed, 128 bits for a 64-bit attack was inconceivable. And yet, within five to 10 years, they were able to attack that one. And then SHA, there are attacks. Um, AES with the buy-click attack, uh, they've now broken, I think, seven or eight of the 10 rounds. Um, if there is something that you need to keep secure, choose the best software and have a plan for upgrading your crypto and any product that you put crypto into, because the attacks are going to get better. You'll need at some point to transition from the broken system to a new one. Um, and so you, you, that will come up during the lifetime of your product. So be thinking about it. That's definitely good advice. <laughs> um, Fallible, you got any more questions you want to sneak in under the hood? No, I think I'm good. I really appreciate the work that you've done here. And thank you for coming to present and, and giving your thank time, you so much to, for your time to this Q&A session. Yeah. Um, there are some more people that have some more questions coming in, if you're willing to do so. If you would put your contact information in the Track 1 uh, channel on Discord here, we will uh, get that out there. Um, Folks can, can look you up if you're willing to be available to that. Uh, I also recommend you put all of your, your company information if you're willing to do so, because um, that's a good way for people to find you for those contracts you were talking about. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Absolutely. Take care.